Today is the big one. In one of my recent videos, I went over the KV series of Soviet heavy tanks, going from their inception in 1937 to their obsolescence in around 1944. In that video, which you should definitely watch before this one if you haven't seen it already, I talk about the KV-13, the KV-85, the KV-122, and hint at the vehicle that would replace the KV in Soviet service, the IS. This video will pick up where that one left off, and will cover the inception, design and development of the IS heavy tanks until just before the end of the war. There's a lot to talk about, so let's get started. This is the story of the Josef Stalin tanks. The story of the IS begins back in 1942 with the unsuccessful KV-13. This vehicle was an attempt to adapt the KV-1 into a universal tank, making it smaller, lighter and faster while retaining the good armour of the KV. But what you may not know is that you're looking at the IS-1 and IS-2, both made from modified KV-13 hulls in the summer of 1943 and named after the glorious General Secretary. The IS-1 was Object 233 with a 76mm ZIS-5 gun. The IS-2 was Object 234, which used a 122mm U11 howitzer taken from the failed KV-9. However, the cramped KV-13 chassis with its two-man turret and horrible transmission doomed these vehicles, and it was decided instead to create the new heavy tank series using the KV-1S chassis with its improved power plant and transmission and larger turret. Around the same time though, the Soviets captured and tested a Tiger, and found that both the ZIS-5 and U-11 would be completely inadequate moving forward, and that the new vehicle would need to mount at least an 85mm gun. And this is where it gets a little confusing. At this point, four vehicles were created, mounting two different 85mm guns, the S-31 and the D-5T, on two different hulls, the KV-1S and the KV-13. The 85mm gun fit quite nicely into the larger hull and turret of the KV-1S, and was known as the Object 238. However, it was discovered that the KV-13's shorter hull was not long enough to mount the larger gun, and it had to be extended by 42cm, adding the 6th road wheel back in. Likewise, the KV-13 turret was far too small, and a new, much roomier design was mounted. These KV-13 based vehicles would be known as the Object 237. The other KV-1S was known as Object 239, and mounted the larger turret of the Object 237 onto the KV-1S hull. So, we have two KV-13 based vehicles with the new turret, one KV-1S with the same turret, and one with the old one. Testing showed that the D-5T gun was generally superior to the S-31, and also showed that the smaller turret was completely unworkable, leaving us with the Object 237 and the Object 239 which would be known from this point on as the IS-85 and the KV-85, which are both accepted for production in September of 1943. The IS hulls weren't ready yet, so the KV-85 would serve as a stopgap solution. In the same decree, a 122mm armed IS tank was ordered, along with a 152mm self-propelled howitzer based on the chassis of the IS, in much the same way the SU-152 was based on the chassis of the KV but more on that later. The chief designer at Plant 100, the factory task with developing the IS-122, was our old friend Kotin, the man behind the KV-13. He had noticed that out of all the artillery pieces present at the Battle of Kursk, the 122mm A-19 field gun had proved to be the best for knocking out large enemy vehicles. Kotin and his team realised that it was possible to modify this gun to fit into the IS. The barrel of the A-19 was mated to the mounting system of the U-11 howitzer, which had also been used for the 85mm D-5T. To reduce weight and help balance this mammoth gun, the barrel was cut down by 24cm and a T-shaped muzzle brake was added to compensate for this. By November 1943, the modified IS, known as Object 240, was ready for testing, which, by and large, went extremely well. At a range of 1500 meters, the new gun, designated D-25T, could go through one side of a panther's turret and come out the other, tearing the far side of the turret off along the welds and hurling it several meters. In one less successful test, the muzzle brake was torn off the end of the gun, with shrapnel from this explosion almost killing Clement Voroshilov, who had been there to observe the test. 
As a result, the T-shaped muzzle brake was first replaced with a dual chamber German design, before being replaced again by a much more efficient indigenous design a few months later. The IS-122 was accepted into service at the end of 1943, but as production started in January of 1944, it was decided to simplify the designation. The IS-85 would become the IS-1, while the IS-122 would be known as the IS-2. Now we've clarified what the IS actually is, we can talk about the design. The armour profile is completely different, with the front plates sloping away from the driver's position, a stark contrast to the flat plates of the KVs. This hull armour belt is 120mm thick around the driver's vision hatch, transitioning to around 100mm by the time it meets the 90mm side armour plates. On the right hand side of this belt is a fixed 7.62mm hull machine gun, operated electronically by the driver. The lower frontal plate was 100mm and the plate joining this to the upper belt was 60mm, angled back at 72 degrees. The armour profile meant that the vehicle had much higher effective armour thickness than the KV series, but was slightly lighter at around 45 tonnes. The 12 cylinder diesel engine in the rear of the vehicle provided 520 horsepower, giving it a respectable power to weight ratio of about 11.5 horsepower per tonne and a reported max speed of 37 km per hour. The turret was brand new and was a large three man design with 100mm of armour all over, a large commander's cupola, and two roof hatches. One 7.62mm machine gun was mounted coaxially and one, in typical Soviet fashion, was mounted on the rear of the turret. Before I talk about the IS-2's combat debut, I have to, believe it or not, talk about the IS-3, the IS-4 and the IS-5, but not the ones you're thinking of. The 122mm D25T had decent performance against Panther or Tiger equivalent armour, but there were a few huge trade-offs, namely the very small ammunition load of only 28 rounds, and the slow rate of fire of only about 3 rounds per minute. Ideally, a new vehicle would mount a smaller, more sensible gun that had better anti-tank performance. This is the IS-3. It mounted the D5T 85BM, a high power version of the D5T with a muzzle velocity of 900 meters per second and much better anti-tank performance as a result. This was tested for a few months until it was found that the barrel could not withstand the forces being applied to it and the project was cancelled as a result. Instead, a 100mm cannon would be mounted, with two competing guns, the D-10T and the S-34. After some delays and general Soviet tomfoolery, the D-10T would be mounted in an unchanged IS turret, creating this vehicle, Object 245, or the IS-4. Meanwhile, the S-34 would be mounted in the modified IS turret, in which the commander and gunner moved to the right of the turret and the loader moved to the left, in an attempt to increase the rate of fire. This vehicle, seen here, was Object 248, also known as the IS-5. The need to create a new turret meant that the IS-5 was delayed, only being finished in June 1944. Testing in July saw the rejection of the IS-4 and the IS-5 was chosen for production, with the addition of a mechanical gun rammer and a vertical stabiliser. By all accounts, the IS-5 was an amazing vehicle, with superior mobility, penetration, rate of fire, ammunition load and accuracy when compared to the IS-2. But the Soviets already had 85mm and 122mm guns in mass production, so it was a big decision if they were going to add a 100mm gun to the mix. However, by the autumn of 1944, the 122mm had begun to perform a lot better against German tanks. In fact, rather mysteriously, all of the Soviet guns had begun to perform a lot better. This was because Germany had run out of manganese, and had switched to using high carbon nickel alloys for its armour, which was now considerably more brittle. Soviet crews would see their shell ricochet off enemy tanks, but leaving the enemy vehicle in pieces as the armour cracked and collapsed, often along the weld lines. In the end, it was decided that the 122mm was more than sufficient, and already available in large numbers, and so the IS-5 was shelved. The IS would first see combat in February of 1944. By this time, most of the IS-1 vehicles armed with the 85mm gun had been rebuilt into IS-2s, but some IS-1s apparently did see combat, despite the relative scarcity of the vehicle. The IS-2s were deployed in their own Guards Heavy Tank regiments, with 21 tanks apiece. These heavy tank formations would be used mostly in offensive operations as breakthrough tanks, using their powerful 122mm shells 
to blast apart enemy tanks and infantry with relative ease. The thing is, Soviet commanders naturally would pick weak spots in the German lines to conduct these breakthrough operations, meaning that the IS-2s rarely fought large numbers of enemy tanks. The Germans found that the IS-2 was well armed and well armoured, but not as mobile as their Panthers or Tigers, and noted that the crews of these vehicles lacked experience. Soviet commanders were soon asking for more and more IS tanks, which proved to be a big ask. The IS was not all that easy to manufacture, and production was still ramping up at a number of new factories. To make production easier, and to address concerns about the capability of the nose of the vehicle to resist 88mm fire, the front plate was simplified, with the driver's hatch removed and replaced with a fixed viewport, and the armour changed to a single angled plate, 100mm at 60 degrees. They wanted to increase the armour on the turret as well, but the increased weight would have made the gun even less stable, so this idea was abandoned. Additionally, a 12.7mm DSHK machine gun was added to the commander's cupola on the roof to provide some anti-infantry and anti-air firepower. This upgrade package was known as the IS-2 Model 1944, or is sometimes referred to as the IS-2M. By the end of 1944, there were over 2,000 IS tanks fighting on the front lines, participating in offensive after offensive. The IS, while well armoured, was far from invulnerable, and losses were relatively high. Even the weak spots in the German lines were riddled with mines, anti-tank guns and anti-tank rocket crews. Soviet tankers would often go head to head with Panthers and Tigers, and in most cases, it was simply a matter of who shot first. The IS and the Panther both weighed about 45 tonnes. They had very similar anti-armour performance, while the IS had thicker armour and the Panther had better mobility. The Panther could carry 81 rounds for its long 75mm gun, while the IS-2 could only carry 28. On the flip side, the IS fired a 25kg HE shell, while the Panthers was only 7kg. Compared to the Tiger, the IS was 10 tons lighter, and still boasted marginally superior armour protection. The guns were similar, but the Tiger had a much better rate of fire, as well as superior mobility, ergonomics, optics, and three times the ammunition load. The Tiger II was a different story altogether, with a massive gun and almost impenetrable armour. Luckily, the IS would only engage this vehicle on a few occasions, and most were at a close enough range that it was a near-peer engagement. The Tiger II did prompt the development of a new, improved IS vehicle, but that will have to be the topic of another video. Before I say anything more about the IS, I feel it's my duty to mention a different vehicle. One that is, apparently, in very high demand. The ISU. I talked about the KV-14 in my KV video, which was known as the SU-152. This was a casemate tank destroyer slash assault gun based on the KV chassis, but mounting 152mm howitzer. It saw great success in the summer of 1943, with its 152mm gun earning the nickname Zverboy, meaning Beast Hunter. Naturally, after the success of these vehicles, it was no surprise that the same would be attempted on the chassis of the IS. However, the KV's hull was actually a good bit deeper than that of the IS, so to provide the same interior volume, the superstructure mounted on top to house the gun, would need to be a good bit taller than that of the SU-152. The ISU-152 had thicker armour than its cousin, with 90mm of frontal armour and 75mm on the sides, while the SU only had 75mm on the front and 60 on the sides. Aside from that, it was almost identical, and the ISU, Object 241, was developed alongside the IS-85, with production starting in the summer of 1943. But an issue was very quickly discovered. There was an alarming lack of the ML20S 152mm howitzer. There was, however, an attractive surplus of the 122mm A19, and work began on converting it to fit into the ISU. This was relatively simple, as the A19 and ML20 both used the same carriage when deployed as towed weapons. This new vehicle mounting the A19 was known as Object 242, but when production began in autumn of 1943, it was redesignated the ISU-122. The ISU-152 and ISU-122 were deployed in much the same way as the IS, in their own dedicated heavy self-propelled artillery regiments, each with 21 vehicles. Their main role was to support breakthrough attempts, with the ISU-122 proving to be an incredibly effective long-range tank hunter, and the ISU-152 following in the SU-152's footsteps as an impressive anti-infantry and anti-fortification weapon. In 1944, the rate of fire of the ISU-122 was increased, replacing the A-19 with the D-25T, 
the version fitted to the IS-2. This had a semi-automatic drop breech, which was much faster than the screw breech of the A19. This version also saw an updated mantlet, allowing greater gun traverse angles. It would be known in its production as the ISU-122S or the isu 122 There were also attempts to increase the anti-armor performance of the 152mm gun. Objects 243, 246, 247, 250 and 251. But before I get into those, there's an important vehicle I haven't talked about. Object NordVPN. As you are probably aware, I make my silly little YouTube videos on a computer, one that is connected to the internet. And the internet famously is full of nasty characters, the type of characters that hate my videos and are trying to take me down at every turn. If I'm writing a script in a coffee shop on my laptop, they're trying to steal it. If I'm downloading lovely black and white photos or videos of tanks, they're trying to install malware when I'm not looking. But thankfully, I genuinely do use NordVPN, and you should as well, using this link. Here's why. The coffee shop goon is known as a man in the middle, tricking me into connecting into some free Wi-Fi network and stealing all my juicy secrets when I do so. But using Nord, I can mask my IP address by bouncing my signal all around the globe on up to six devices, leaving him looking like an idiot, a moron, and a fool. As for the malware, Nord Threat Protection scans files as I download them, warning me if any dangerous files are present. You can even use the Nord Travel Smart feature to get cheaper flights, beating the airlines at their own game. Using my link you'll get a huge discount and another free month on top of the free month they're already offering. And just as a little cherry on top, there's a 30 day money back guarantee if you don't like it. So what is there to lose? Use code RWF or click my link in description and keep yourself and your data safe with risk free NordVPN. But back to the silly Soviet Union and their attempts to put an even bigger gun into the ISU. These experiments mounted the BL9 122mm gun, BL8 and BL10 long barreled 152mm guns or the 130mm S26 and 122mm S26-1 naval guns. All of these were theoretically superior to the ML20 but almost all had issues with ergonomics, weight, barrel wear and being unacceptably long. By the time they were ready, the war was pretty much over, while the ISU-122 and 152 had already proven themselves more than capable in combat. All in all, there are about 6,500 ISUs produced, 4,000 during the war and 2,500 afterwards. So now you can stop commenting about the ISU. What you can do if you've enjoyed the video so far is subscribe down below so you can be there to see the second and third part of this video series where I talk about the post-war IS vehicles, the actual IS-3, IS-4 and IS-5, the IS-6, IS-7, IS-8 and the T-10. But for now, we're focusing on the IS-1 and IS-2, the vehicles that started it all. By the end of the war, each tank corps was assigned at least one regiment of IS-2 tanks. Seeing less and less German armour, Enemy infantry soon became the main concern for Soviet tank crews. During the battles in the cramped city streets, handheld anti-tank weapons accounted for nearly 70% of all Soviet tank losses. And these losses were horrific. Forced to advance with their hatches closed so Molotov cocktails or hand grenades weren't dropped on them from above, the crew could rarely exit their cramped, burning vehicles in time if they were unlucky enough to get hit. Soon IS tanks would drive down streets in formation attempting to protect each other from threats. Or if they were lucky, they would be assigned a platoon of submachine gun wielding infantry that could quickly hop off the tank and engage enemy anti-tank squads. Some repair shops would attach these mesh sheets to the sides of IS-2 turrets, hoping to detonate any shape charge projectiles before they could cause significant damage to the tank. Unfortunately for them, the rubble and debris produced during steady fighting tended to break these sheets off, so I'm unsure how effective they actually were. Despite the anti-tank threat, IS-2 tanks, operated by Soviet and Polish crews, smashed their way into Berlin and are the centerpiece of many iconic photos of the battles in the German capital in the last days of the war. After the war ended, the IS-2 remained an important part of the Soviet armoured force. The vehicles designed to replace it, the IS-3 and IS-4, were struggling to adequately do so, but we'll be going into more detail on that in another video. In total, just under 4,000 IS-2s were produced until production stopped in 1945, but in the late 50s when it became clear that, spoiler, the IS-3 and IS-4 were never going to be able to fully replace it, an upgrade program was done known as IS-2M. Not to be confused, of course, with the IS-2M of 1944. 
From 1957, many later model IS-2s were given a more modern V54K engine, new heaters, oil pumps, radios and air cleaners, as well as upgrades to the transmission, suspension and ventilation. The tanks got armoured skirts, the rear machine gun was removed, the driver got a new periscope, and the ammunition load was increased by 7, among many other things. Similar steps were taken to modernise the ageing ISU-152. The ISU-152K was the first of these, starting in 1956. It also got the V54K engine, an increased fuel capacity, upgraded suspension, and some received more armour. The ISU-152M was the final version of the vehicle, developed in 1959 and bringing the ISU up to IS-2M standard. This modernisation programme continued until the mid-1960s, and almost every IS-2 still in service was brought up to the standard. After relations with China deteriorated in the 1970s, IS-2Ms were sent to guard the Russian-Chinese border. Believe it or not, exercises were still being carried out using IS-2s until 1982, and the vehicle was only officially retired in 1995. I hope you've enjoyed this snapshot into the IS-2. Naturally, there's a lot more that I could get into, other variants, its service in other countries, more detail on its combat performance, but I just don't have the time on this occasion, especially with the other IS tanks looming over me. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already, because the post-war Soviet Union was a crazy place, and they produced some crazy heavy tanks. I'll see you in the next one.